Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And then we will have time to address questions after the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Roland Kiesling. Roland is a professor at the University of Hamburg, and he has conducted research on a wide range of African languages from all of the four large African phyla, as well as aerial studies, including contributing to the book chapter that first described the Tanzania Rift Valley area. His research on Datoga began over two decades ago and has covered a range of topics, including directionality, tonal case, and verb classes. Please join me in welcoming him today as he gives his talk Future Tense and Persistive Aspect, Disentangling the Fusion of Paraphrastic Constructions in Datoga Verbal Inflection. Yes, thank you very much, Richard, for reading out the title, today's title. Uh, more precisely, uh, it is an exercise in uh, internal reconstruction. So hello, everybody. And I want to show what I want to show today is that certain verbal paradigms in modern Datoga originate in prior periphrastic constructions of auxiliary verb plus main verb in the subjunctive mood. And this pertains specifically to the future tense and the persistive in both the affirmative and the negative. And in order to get an idea of what this looks like, please compare the future forms. Uh, no, sorry, I'm ahead of uh, schedule here. Yeah, this is the correct one. Uh, compare the future forms in one with the corresponding factative forms of the first person plural and the first person singular. Uh, yeah, these are arranged in columns, as you can see. Roughly speaking, you will find the future marker ad uh, and its allomorph a in red on the left hand side, uh, accompanied by a specific pattern of subject indexing, that is, prefixes plus suffixes, which uh, basically encode the subjunctive mood. And this is marked by SJN in the glossing for the prefix set and the capital B uh, for the suffix set. Uh, this is uh, given in blue then, these prefixes and suffixes indicative of the subjunctive mood. And this pattern is in contrast to the corresponding forms in the factative paradigm on the right side. Uh, which is uh, characterized by another pattern of subject indexing in yellow. And of course, there's no, no future marker here. I use the label factative uh, for uh, a category which is uh, maximally unmarked semantically as well. It might be used uh, with present or with past tense reference. And now this was a, an example of the future. And now uh, we do the same thing for the persistive, comparing the paradigm in, in three, that's the left column, uh, with the corresponding forms of the factative in four, you find a parallel situation. That is the persistive is characterized by its specific marker, which is udu, and uh, you see that is highlighted in red and it is accompanied by the same pattern of subject indexing as the future that is the one which encodes the subjunctive mood and uh, this is basically what my talk will focus on there are indeed more inflectional categories which follow this pattern for example the negative perfect tense and probably others. Uh, for a geographical orientation, you all know this probably, we are in Tanzania and my data are drawn from the Burediga and the Gisamjanga dialects. That is number three 
And number five in this map, which is taken from Rotland, uh, both dialects represent the western and the eastern branch of the Datoga dialect continuum. Mm, so this is for the basic orientation. The uh, verbal inflectional system of all Datoga varieties seems to be characterized by an interaction of prefix and suffix series and various types of yeah, morphophonological and morphotonological alternation which, uh, which marks subject and object participants and express various inflectional categories such as tense, mood and polarity. Overall, uh, verbal inflection, one could say, is uh, or has both agglutinative and fusional characteristics in Datoga. This might be seen in the unmarked affirmative factative paradigms of four Burediga Datoga verbs presented here uh, in this table, that is Ngal to grind, Nus to kill, Ngol to stir, and Pus to sweep, uh, representing the four basic inflectional classes of verbs. Now, in order to digest all this and before delving into the details of the tense mood system, it's important to point out some fundamentals about subject person marking, which will otherwise haunt us through all the rest of the paradigms. Subject indexing is realized by a combination of prefix and suffix sets. The suffix set which marks the factative paradigms shown here is given in blue. It uh, operates uh, on the basis of a twofold segmental contrast here, that is D for the first person singular and plural and the second person plural and uh, versus E in the second person singular and the third person. And there's a subtle contrast in the voicing of the final vowel in the first person singular, which is rather whispered, something like D uh, versus D in the first person plural and second person plural. Um, there are more suffix sets to come in other tense mood paradigms just to alert you for this. Now the maximum of five contrastive subject forms is marked by a series of prefixes. These are given in red here. There's an allomorphic variation of these prefixes in the third person uh, form, which compels us to recognize these four distinct verbal inflectional classes which are labeled as one minus, one plus, two minus, and two plus. Verb class two, this is to be seen here, is characterized by long vowels in all prefixes, whereas verb class one has short vowel allomorphs for the second person singular and the third person. The opposition of um, the plus versus minus sets of allomorphs is marked by a specific uh, by, by specific vowel alternations which reflect a prior vowel harmony system that is the vowel qualities a e and o of the minus atr set alternate with plus atr counterparts and that is e e o in these prefixes uh, now, remarkably, the vowel quality a has an ambivalent uh, status since it acts as minus ATR counterpart to A and as plus ATR counterpart to A at the same time. Furthermore, the initial consonant of uh, prefixes in the first person singular, the second plural, and the third person, uh, the, this consonant alternates in accordance with the prior vowel harmony system. That is, we get the voiceless uvula ka in a minus ATR environment versus voiced vila g in the plus ATR environment. You may have noticed now that suspiciously all uh, prefixes recognized so far and identified here, they all start with the same underlying consonant that is uh, pa or g, 
and indeed in a more rigorous um, morphological analysis, this initial consonant must be granted the status of a separate marker uh, that is uh, for declarative, affirmative, non-perfect tense. In brief, um, the observations on subject indexing I have just developed are summarized in this slide. We have four suffix sets. The one presented, uh, just presented is the set marked by, uh, that I've marked uh, with capital R in the glossing, and it characterizes the factative inflectional pattern of non-derived verbs. We have uh, four prefix sets, one minus, one plus, two minus, and two plus, with a maximal differentiation only in the third person. Uh, these classes continue the erstwhile nilotic vowel harmony system on a purely morphologicized level. And typologically remarkable uh, is that um, we have get a formal marking of the affirmative declarative category by g, which alternates with h, and uh, in other, well, in the negative, it alternates with m. As you can see in uh, these uh, paradigms for the verb na to grind, the ka uh, g for declarative affirmative in the factative, it regularly alternates, for example, with m in the negative paradigm, that is the third column, which is indicated in blue, the marker m here. And it alternates with N or S in the perfect paradigm. It alternates with zero in the imperative and the subjunctive, and with R in the prohibitive. All of these are marked in different colors. Now comparing the paradigms, we must expand our morphological analysis with respect to both uh, prefixes and suffixes. Uh, the first generalization pertains to the prefix slots to be recognized in the inflected verb, and this is shown in this slide. I had already in indicated or uh, what has so far been referred to as subject markers is more complex and must actually be broken down into a maximal a succession of three morphemes here, the bare subject marking uh, prefixes which are preceded by two slots, one for tense and the initial one for polarity uh, and mood. And the second observation uh, pertains to the subject markers themselves. They seem to come in three mutually exclusive sets which are given in full in the next slide, which is this one. Uh, their distribution seems to be determined by semantic criteria. So we have a factative series of subject indexes versus a subjunctive or dependent series of subject indexes. And a third one for the perfect tense, which is uh, given here just for the sake of completeness. We won't be dealing much with that one. Uh, you can see that these um, paradigms or these marker sets, they overlap to some extent, but crucial differences remain. So for example, in the first person singular, we have an opposition of a uh, versus ra. There's an additional consonant there. And in the second person singular, we have an opposition of e versus a. And the first person plural, we have a tonal opposition of a versus a. Um, yeah, in contrast to the ATR triggered allomorphies, these contrasts, that is the factative versus the subjunctive, these are purely morphological and in no way determined by phonological parameters. Now, for the rest of the discussion, the distinction of the factative versus the subjunctive paradigm um, is of paramount importance. But with regard to the spectrum of inflectional paradigms, uh, 
we see here, which is a slide that uh, is repeated from a previous slide, we still have to face the fact that what has been presented as subject indexing suffixes, it comes also in different uh, series. Uh, the full picture um, is given in uh, this table, that is four suffix sets must be recognized which have fairly minimal contrasts. They are arranged according to their degree of formal differentiation and amount of syncretism involved. So you can see that series A and series or series A presents three suffixes with a syncretism of the first person and the second person plural in the form D and second person singular and third person in the form I. Uh, series B presents a differentiation by two distinct suffixes with syncretisms of first person singular and third person in the form E versus second person singular and plural and first person plural converging in the form A. Uh, series C now presents a differentiation by two distinct suffixes but in contrast to B it allows for a syncretism of all first and second persons in the form E and only the third person is singled out by a distinct suffix R. And series D finally presents an image of total neutralization of all person contrasts in a single suffix. Now, uh, finally, with this uh, being set, we are in a position to examine more closely the crucial paradigms, and that is future and persistive. I will start with the future paradigm. Uh, let us look at this one here. As we compare the crucial parameters that I have mentioned, prefix and suffix set selection, we can see that the future paradigms in all verb classes in 10 take suffix series B, characterized by suffix E in the third person singular, uh, third person and the first person singular versus R in the rest. Furthermore, it takes the subject indexing prefix set that has been identified as subjunctive or dependent, neither the factative nor the perfect uh, one. The uh, diagnostic details uh, which differentiate this pattern from, let's say, the factative one, they are given in, uh, in red here. Uh, viewed from another perspective, we can say that the future is formed by simply adding the future marker ad or its allomorph a plus the declarative affirmative prefix g uh, on top of, uh, of the subjunctive paradigm and in order to make this clearer we can start from this future or these future paradigms and simply subtract the future marker and the declarative affirmative prefix that is get rid of the markers which I have uh, which have been grayed out here. So just to switch back, this is the future paradigm. Now the markers which define that future paradigm have been grayed out. And if we uh, drop them, as soon as we drop them, we end up with the subjunctive paradigms which have been listed here. Uh, so we see that the affirmative future is clearly grafted on the inflectional pattern of the subjunctive. Beside the affirmative future tense, there, is, uh, there are at least four more inflectional paradigms which kind of grow on the subjunctive in such a way, and that is the negative future, the affirmative and the negative persistive, and the negative perfect tense. What they all have in common is the subject indexing prefixes of the subjunctive set and the suffix series B, which also characterizes the subjunctive. These diagnostic features of the subjunctive pattern are highlighted uh, by red for easy identification as we briefly pass these other paradigms now. And uh, here is the 
mm, the negative future paradigm contrasted with the affirmative future, you see the same pattern of subject indexing prefixes and suffixes. Uh, the same uh, pattern holds for the persistive affirmative on the left hand and negative on the right hand. And uh, we move straight to the negative perfect tense for all four inflectional classes, hoping that the red marks will be sufficient here for guiding you towards identification of the subjunctive imprint in all these paradigms. Uh, these parallels to the subjunctive are quite revealing and significant since there is a host of other paradigms which take different types of combinations of prefix and suffix sets. Maybe most remarkable in this respect is the fact that the prohibitive paradigm is not built on the subjunctive paradigm as might have been expected, but it rather takes the factative prefix set and the suffix set R, which is shown here with the diagnostic markers highlighted in blue, which would allow for a clear distinction from the subjunctive paradigm. Now, mm, this table uh, is quite complex. It presents a concise overview of subject marking uh, sub or subject indexing prefix and suffix sets across tense, aspect, and mood paradigms in Datoga, taking into account their dependency on two further uh, distributional uh, criteria, and that is polarity and derivational status of the verb. As for polarity, this has simply been marked by plus for affirmative and versus minus for the negative here. As for the derivational status, plain font means non-derived and derived verb stems go together. Italics stands for non-derived stems only, while bold means only derived stems. Uh, so to give you an example of, of uh, how, how to read all this, the factative, factative paradigms have to be differentiated maximally. The affirmative factative of non-derived stems is inflected with suffix set R. The negative uh, counterpart is inflected with suffix set C, which you see here. And uh, derived stems are inflected with a set D for the factative that is to be seen here, regardless of whether they are affirmative or negative. Now, uh, this might be very confusing, and indeed the semantic basis or the historical motivation of these four different suffix sets remains largely obscure, and I don't want to dwell on this here, but one thing emerges clearly from this table, and that is the cluster of the future paradigms, the persistive paradigms, and the negative perfect paradigm, which all share the same subject coding pattern with the affirmative subjunctive. This is marked by red at the intersection of the suffix series B and the subjunctive prefix set. And this suggests that all these grammatical categories in Datoga ultimately derive from a frozen periphrastic construction involving eroded auxiliaries inflected for polarity, followed by the main verb, which is inflected for the subjunctive, which is uh, captured in the formula given at the bottom of this slide. An internal reconstruction such as this one is corroborated by evidence from contemporary formations of periphrastic constructions with different modal uh, verbs, such as the ones given here, 
they are highlighted in blue. That's the verbs gasai, want, moose, to be able, nung, let or abandon, why, to go, uh, or uh, in its uh, suppletive form here in e, which is un, and by, to do in a hurry. Note here that the dependent main verb is always in the subjunctive form, characterized by the subjunctive suffix indexing, uh, so, subjunctive subject indexing pattern, combining the dependent prefix set and the suffix set B. For example, um, 17B, which is uh, Dalach, Fuanda, Huanda. I can ignore a bowstring. Mm, the auxiliary is moose to be able, which requires the dependent verb laj to cut, to be in the subjunctive and coded by the sub, uh, subjunctive subject index da for first person singular and the suffix e of series b. Okay, I won't go through the other examples uh, here. There is a still further support for the hypothetical periphrastic origin of both future and persistive constructions, since uh, both markers stand out against the rest of the paradigms by virtue of their potential to combine with fully inflected verbs and form still more complex periphrastic constructions such as an anterior future and a counter expectual future persistive. We start with the anterior future, uh, which is given here. This one is formed by combining the future tense, uh, which you see realized by uh, the, um, the marker adje here, or adja, it's, uh, it's allomorph and the perfect paradigm that is uh, so the future is uh, given in blue here for easy identification and the perfect in red semantically this includes a kind of dubitative notion which might be rendered as possibly in translation or uh, the notion of a counter ex expectual early realization which might be rendered as already in translation um, for example in a where we have uh, she will already have eaten uh, which uh, combines the future marker ad or rather adye here with a perfect tense marker for the third person ni to render this meaning we move to the counter expectual persistive future which is formed by combining the future tense with the persistive paradigm uh, for example in a uh, in a where the future marker adya is directly followed by the persistive marker gudu so what will you still be afraid of him for that would be uh, the um, translation of this. Uh, both periphrastic constructions show that the initial future marker differs from the future marker ad as it occurs in non-complex constructions. First it comes in a long in a longer form. Uh, you see adya here in the counter expectual persistive future and as we move back one slide we see adya even with a long vowel or adye in the anterior anterior future so it is uh, the marker is augmented by a final vowel vis-a-vis -vis its ordinary form ad um, second observation is this additional vowel is actually invariably uh, is invariable throughout the inflectional paradigm and thus insensitive to subject marking. That is, subject indexing is restricted to the inner layer of a tense aspect markers, which are immediately adjacent to the verb, and that is 
the perfect um, tense markers here in the anterior future and in the pers persistive uh, future it is the persistive marker. Okay, this might be interpreted uh, after all in two ways. Um, and this is shown in the schemes given here. Either the, contem uh, the contemporary future marker ad goes back to a prior adverbial rather than a verb, or it goes back to an auxiliary which has lost erstwhile subject indexing, the adverbial hypothesis under A, A mm, easily explains the absence of verbal characteristics such as subject indexing prefixes on the TAM marker on AG. However, it raises new analytical problems since it fails to explain the presence of polarity inflection markers, G versus M, preceding the future marker, and it fails to explain the subjunctive inflection in the following main verb. The auxiliary hypothesis in B, on the other hand, could easily account for both of these quirks as relics of the prior status of the future marker as an auxiliary verb. With regard to the absence of subject indexing, it might be argued that the final vowel in the future markers given here, adya, the, the, the second a, and the long adye and adya in this uh, variant, that these uh, long vowels um, actually represent the terminal trace of an erstwhile subject of erstwhile subject markers which have become eroded, neutralized and reduced to a single vowel mora in the course of uh, erosion and fusion, which is actually a common corollary of the process of grammaticalization and reanalysis. Now, there's still another piece of morphosyntactic evidence for the auxiliary source of the future marker ad, and that is its syntactic independency in various other constructions. That is in relative clauses and in a construction which seems like a nominal uh, predication followed by a cleft. We start with the relative clauses in this slide. The future marker here has a slightly divergent form, namely ya. And it retains a certain degree of syntactic independency in that it might be separated from the verb by constituents such as adverbials in example A. Mm, so in, in that one, ya is separated from the, from the verb guala by an adverbial shinada, that is uh, evening or in the evening. And this confirms the point that the future marker here is actually not a verbal prefix, but rather a proclitic. That is, it has a certain syntactic uh, independence. Mm, moving to the next one, I'm not sure about these constructions, which are taken from narratives of the Burger Corpus in, of 1935. They could be, uh, could be nominal predications in which the future marker gadya acts as a predicator, which seems to be followed by a relative clause, so that the meaning uh, of A might rather be rendered in a cleft, such as it will be everybody who sends his person to the house of his friends. Under this analysis, one would have to grant the future marker not only syntactic independency, but also the capacity to establish a predication. Another problem, however, hinges on the analysis of the item GABA, which has been glossed here as every. Mm, since there's a verb, BA, have, meaning have, Gadya Gaba might simply 
be interpreted or represent the regular form of have as inflected for future. But in that case, I have uh, semantic problems deriving a meaning such as everybody from it will have a person. I cite these examples here hoping that um, the assembled Datoga expertise might have more uh, conclusive ideas about the analysis than myself here. Okay, um, I will conclude now. So we can say future tense, persistive aspect and the negative perfect tense in Datoga seem to have developed from erstwhile periphrastic constructions involving an auxiliary followed by the main verb inflected for the subjunctive. This hypothesis, hypothesis is supported by morphosyntactic evidence concerning collocational properties of the involved markers, that is aj, udu, and e. And it is um, also supported by comparison to com temporary fully fledged periphrastic constructions for expressing volative or habilitative uh, notions. This table uh, presents a panchronic view on Datoga periphrases, aligning the contemporary auxiliaries with internal constructions provided for the auxiliary sources of the future tense and the persistive aspect. In the course of grammaticalization and fusion with the main verb, the auxiliary source items must have lost some of their verbal properties. In this case, their capability to host subject indexing prefixes while retaining a residual verbal inflectional debris, namely the affirmative declarative prefix and the negative prefix. Rigid uh, morphological analysis allows for an internal reconstruction of two source auxiliaries, namely ad for the future and gudu or guadu uh, for the persistive, probably, both probably assigned to the plus ATR set since the affirmative declarative prefix g invariably comes up with the plus ATR allomorph the vela, the voiced vela throughout the affirmative future and persistive paradigm, irrespective of the harmony class of the main verb. And it does not display the verb class induced alternation uh, with qa, uh, which is characteristic of inflectional forms of first person singular, second plural, and third person in collocation with the minus ATR verb class. However, um, their ultimate lexical origin of aj and gudu must uh, remain uh, obscure so far, at least on the Datoga level, hopefully a search for potential cognates in a broader southern nilotic or nilotic perspective might shed more light on their ultimate lexical origins. In case you have ideas or offers of potential cognates, they are, of course, most welcome. And this is where I stop. Badis Choda, Giro Bilja, thank you very much for your virtual attention. All right, thank you very much, Roland, for your presentation. I think we can now begin the question and answer section. Yes. If anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, you can do so using the Zoom chat module. And I will start with my own question to give other participants time to, to write their questions. Um, well, I'm very interested in this uh, historical analysis of the grammaticalization of paraphrastic constructions. And um, I, I find it very fascinating because in Datoga we see uh, multiple layers of uh, grammaticalized material. And um, one question that I have uh, about this grammaticalized material is that the uh, the source construction that you have proposed? Um, it has uh, the uh, uh, polarity prefix. So if we uh, go back to slide uh, twenty four, yes, we see um, in 
uh, letter C, the periphrastic source, has yeah. a polarity prefix on the auxiliary, but not a polarity prefix on the following verb. Yeah. And there's, uh, it could be argued that there's some evidence of the remnants of uh, a, a affirmative prefixes on these uh, following verbs. For example, um, I believe Rotland um, uh, left it an, an open question whether or not the voice velar stops, uh, well, and also uvular stops in the, yeah. the third person subjunctive forms uh, are actually affirmative prefixes or they're just sort of some sort of fossilized form. But it seems to be some evidence of a, a previous uh, fully uh, functional uh, affirmative prefix. And then also we see in the uh, persistive uh, that in certain contexts, uh, this uh, velar stop appears. Um, and I believe there's another, uh, let's see, there's a, another uh, proclitic goal that has been reported um, in uh, Gisam Janga, and I've also seen it in Asam Jig de Toga. So we see this, uh, what, what appears to be the affirmative prefix uh, repeated multiple times within a, a, a single um, a grammaticalized uh, uh, periphrastic construction. Yeah. So does that warrant an analysis of the, uh, of the periphrastic uh, source construction, including a slot for the affirmative prefix on the second verb? Yeah, thank you very much. That's very complicated. And um, I, um, I'm a bit uh, hesitant because this would uh, kind of undermine uh, the, um, the explanation that I've been given here since the subjunctive uh, seems to be characterized in um, the var varieties that I, I have seen. This subjunctive is characterized by the absence of uh, this uh, declarative marker, g. So uh, following this uh, hypothesis, you would not actually expect it. But of course, one could uh, follow your argument and say that after all, maybe we have different sources. We have a subjunctive source or maybe we have another source where the uh, inflected, uh, where, the, where the main verb is actually not inflected for the subjunctive. This uh, cannot be excluded. Uh, so you would argue in that case that the, mm, the third person um, subject marker, which includes g or p, um, yeah, is uh, is a relic of that or a remnant of uh, this one. Um, yeah, it could be, might be the case. But uh, under this analysis, you would have to explain uh, why this marker has disappeared from the other uh, person, the first person and the second person. Um, I would, uh, therefore, I would hesitate uh, to fully follow this uh, trace, but, uh, well, let's keep it in mind. I'm not uh, now familiar, I, I should look uh, at uh, Rotland's uh, Southern Nihilotic reconstructions, but I think that he, for the third person, he reconstructs uh, some uh, marker which has an initial vela, the voiceless then, because it's on the southern nilotic level. Yeah, that's what I can say so far. I don't know if I have given, if I have uh, satisfied um, uh, all of, answered all your questions. There were other points, maybe. No, no, I think that's, uh, your, your answer was uh, quite sufficient. And I think you're, yes, you're, Correct, it's... Um, you mentioned the persistive and the proclitic. Yes. Uh, another proclitic, uh, and I, this escaped my uh, attention here. What uh, proclitic? Was it gola or... Yes, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Was it uh, already or... Yes, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, about gola, I'm not... Uh, I, mm, yeah, maybe this gola is... a. Uh, yeah, it slipped from my memory now, but I had the impression that it's actually a frozen inflected form of some verb which uh, has the 
you know, the shape of la or la with a, with some um, final consonant which has been dropped. I don't remember. I would have to look at the data again. Uh, but this is definitely a trace that I will follow up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And uh, yeah, just uh, one comment to to follow up on this discussion. Um, looking at letter A now, the adverbial source, uh, I think there is actually some evidence uh, of this or something somewhat similar, maybe not an adverbial, but um, rather a, a copula of some kind with the uh, conditional prefix E. Okay. Uh, so in Asamjeg de Toga, um, in the conditional uh, perfect, uh, there is actually a, an affirmative that follows the um, the conditional prefix, and that's for all persons. So first person, second person, and third person. So you have e plus uh, followed by the uh, voice velar stop. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's uh, then I think good evidence of that sort of uh, grammaticalization, which is distinct from this sort of uh, periphrastic construction that involves an auxiliary verb that has oh, yeah. the affirmative prefix before it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I have not, uh, for this presentation, I have not looked into the conditional uh, forms so far. And there also seem, as you mentioned it now, there seems to be another conditional irrealis, um, which has a form like mousse. Uh, in in the in old in the in the Gisamjanga variety, but I have not come to terms with that one, uh, and probably I would have to collect more data. It's only found in one paradigm from the Burger Corpus so far. I don't know if you have seen that. I have not seen that one. I have seen this uh, um uh, temporal prefix. Uh, which, ah, okay, that's still yeah. another one. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are many of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you are perfectly right that um, we should be prepared for a situation that we have multiple sources. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Andrew Harvey, who is uh, here yeah. with me as well, he has a question he'd like to ask. Yeah. Hi, Roland. Uh, what I find striking is the similarity of the preverbal clitic complex in your Datoga data here and the preverbal clitic complex in South <laughs> i.e. that we have sort of these inflectional elements that can index arguments occurring before the verb. Yeah. Uh, and given that I know you're familiar with both language families, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about this construction, you know, across these two language families, perhaps from an aerial contact story perspective, or maybe there's a similar grammatical grammaticalization pathway, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for raising this uh, point. Uh, I've thought about that uh, since uh, long uh, but I see one uh, striking uh, difference or one fundamental difference uh, with um, most of these markers that I presented. And this specifically pertains to the subject indexing uh, morphemes. They actually seem to be prefixes, uh, not proclitics. So what we need, and I don't know if uh, you have done that, Richard, to, uh, to look at this uh, whole um, complex, this preverbal uh, complex of markers and test it out, uh, which, um, which markers actually have a prefix character and which are kind of more independent and uh, should rather be um, interpreted as proclitics. I have given some piece of evidence concerning specific uh, constructions here, and it would, uh, or to my feeling, it would, uh, one would need to test this systematically in, um, with respect to insertion of adverbials uh, between uh, the marker and the verb itself. But uh, I have not tested this systematically. But what I can say is that the subject uh, indexing, mm. Um, mm, yeah, the subject indexes, they seem to be quite fixed. Uh, they cannot, to my knowledge, they cannot 
be uh, separated from the verb. So I, I, uh, is that an answer to your question, Andrew? I mean, it's, uh, it is to an extent, I mean, in that yeah. perhaps it raises the prospect of, of these, maybe you can't define them as pre-verb clitic complexes, but of course, the movement of, of, of a clitic to becoming a prefix, I mean, you know, that's sort of a well, that's sort of yeah. a well-established grammaticalization pathway. So maybe, you know, they are similar yeah. things, but there are long different stages of that grammaticalization climb. But again, yeah, I think it's worthwhile to actually do the tests and to see yeah. the empirical status clinic yeah, versus I, prefix. Yeah, I think, I think there are several layers and um, the, mm. the closest, uh, yeah, these subject indexing, uh, the subject indexes, they are closest to the verb and they must probably be granted prefix status uh, also uh, because uh, in a wider southern nilotic prefixes, these have been reconstructed as prefixes based on uh, the, um, the evidence from the other southern nilotic um, yeah, uh, languages. But uh, yeah, the other markers which uh, come on top of that, they should be critically tested, I think. And right. then, the, the, then we should, from that, we can, uh, from, from there, we can look at the Southern Cushitic languages again and draw parallels. It seems, for example, for the conditional, uh, I see parallels. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, all these other little items which attach before uh, I'm, <laughs> these might be candidates <laughs> for, <laughs> for, a, for an aerial comparison. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Right. right. Thank you for this point. It's very good. All right, well, thank you. I think that's all of the questions that we have for today. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for participating. I'd like to remind everyone that recordings of all the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. The next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, October 30th by Professor Martin Maus, and the title of that presentation is the Iraq uh, Imper Imperfective and its uh, challenges for morphology. Uh, thank you again everyone for participating and thank you Roland for presenting and I hope to see all of you again at our next webinar.